In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we come before you on this beautiful day in thanksgiving for our Lenten journey in which we have begun, and, and as Jesus reveals his glory on the mountain today, Lord Jesus, we just ask you to be transfigured before us this day in your Eucharistic glory, that we may transform our souls to look and live more like you. Open up our hearts and our ears to hear what it is you wish us to hear, and my voice to proclaim your praise. We ask this through Christ our Lord. O oh, Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. I love this story of the transfiguration. It truly is a, a, a beautiful scene. It's a beautiful uh, revelation of the mystery of Jesus' divinity to his apostles. And I want to take a different look at it this year. It always comes up in the, uh, the, the second Sunday of Lent, and we get it on the Feast of the Transfiguration, and we hear it elsewhere. But I want to take a little bit different look at it this, this year, if you will. I want to propose for us that the transfiguration, the event that takes place on Mount Tabor, uh, the transfiguration itself is more, it is actually a, a Eucharistic feast. It is Jesus pointing to the Eucharistic banquet of how he will fulfill us with his grace and his abundance of his love in the Holy Eucharist. Three points where we're headed, three points. The conversation, Isaac and our mountain. The conversation, Isaac in our mountain. Have you ever, ever wondered about the conversation that, that Jesus has with Elijah and Moses on the mountain? You know, Peter and James and John, they're sitting there like, oh my gosh, what'd they say? Holy cow, who is, oh my gosh, it's Moses. Wow, what's going on? Ever wonder about the conversation? It really is, it really is fascinating. It's mind boggling. And, you know, so we hear from Mark's account of the transfiguration, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have the transfiguration and they tell their account of it in the gospel. John doesn't have the transfiguration. John is writing from the perspective that Jesus is unveiling his divinity little by little, little by little. And so John doesn't have it in there. We hear from Mark's account today. And Mark doesn't say what is said. He just says that Elijah and Moses appeared on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and they were conversing. But Luke does say what they said in their conversation. Go back and read Luke's account. But Luke says, he says that there appeared Elijah and Moses conversing with Jesus on the mountain, and they were talking about, they were conversating about Jesus' Passover. Jesus' Passover, the Passover. <clears throat> That's an, a, a familiar word, or at least it ought to be for us. Remember the, the story of the Passover, how it is that, that the Jews are enslaved in, in Egypt for 400 years, and then God, in his love and goodness for the Jewish people, he sends Moses to set them free. God sends the, 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 the plagues to, to Pharaoh. And then on that last plague, remember what it was, that the firstborn child, the firstborn son would be wiped out, but that God would spare his people, the Jewish people, the Israelites. He would spare them by how? By shedding the blood of a lamb, very important, and taking the lamb's blood and putting it above the doorposts. And then the angel of death would pass over, pass over, <clears throat> would pass over the houses where the blood of the lamb was sprinkled, and then, then they would be set free in their exodus, in their, their passageway through the Red Sea. So the, the blood of the lamb is very important for us to recall. And that's what they're conversing about here on the mountain. Elijah, the great, the great prophet, Moses, the great lawgiver, they're talking about the Passover, but not just the Passover, about Jesus' Passover because he becomes the lamb of God. He becomes the lamb of sacrifice. He is the lamb of God, and it is his blood that sets us free, not just over the lintels of a doorpost, but his blood on the lintels of the cross that sets us free, not from slavery to Pharaoh, but slavery to sin. You see, we see Jesus' sacrifice is actually prefigured so perfectly in that first reading that we heard. 
the, the reading of, of Abraham and his almost sacrifice of Isaac. When we think, when I, when I, when I gave a, uh, when we think about this, uh, this, this almost sacrifice of Abraham, it stirs up something in us. It stirs up an emotion. Why would God do that? What was God trying to say? And when I gave a talk recently at Oakland University to open talk to all of the students, and one of the students angrily brought this story up to showcase God's brutality and shouted me down, how could you worship a God that would do something like this? And this is the point completely. And if you, if you think that same thing, you're way off. It shows a lack of faith, it shows unbelief, and it actually shows an inability to, to understand the Christian faith. That Abraham's story isn't about God's savagery. It isn't about his brutality, but about his mercy. That he stays Abraham's hand and looks at the sacrifice of Abraham as our father in faith, and that God will in fact send us his only son, who fulfills the prophecy of Isaac, and that his son is crucified for our salvation, and that Isaac was actually a foreshadowing of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. But it's getting back to the point here of the Eucharist. Notice the words that are there that, that the author of Genesis uses. Notice the words that Abraham spies a ram in the thickets, a ram, not a lamb, a ram, because God provides the ram for his people at that time for sacrifice, but the lamb is yet to come, and the lamb of sacrifice will come, and we know when he comes, when John the Baptist cries out, behold the lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world, where do we hear that at mass? When the priest holds up the Eucharist. Behold the Lamb of God. So here, Jesus, on the top of the mountain, is discussing the Passover. Moses goes up on top of a mountain after the Passover, received the Ten Commandments. There on top of the mountain, a cloud speaks to Moses. Here on top of the mountain, the cloud opens up. This is my beloved Son. Throughout the Passover, the Jews, as they were, as they were merging and they were marching through the desert, God fed them with manna from heaven, bread from heaven. And what did they do? They built tents for 40 years in the desert. What does Peter say he wants to do? Lord, let's build a tent. Let's build a tent. Let's stay here. So Jesus is here. He is the lamb. He is the lamb in which Isaac is fulfilled. He's the fulfillment of this. But how is this Eucharistic? As, as I always say, too, oftentimes in my Bible study and, and, and when preaching, we have to know the context of everything of what's taking place. Context, context, context. I love movies just like, just like y'all do, right? I, I love a good movie. I love the drama. I love the plot twist. I love the buildup. You know, I love the, uh, you know, the, the scene changes and all of that. And I love the foreshadowing. So what's the context of this scene? What's the build-up? You know, there's something building up. And this is actually, we can think of it as a play. You know, if you're into plays rather than movies or whatever, you have act one, act two, act three. This is act three of four. It, we could see it as a culmination. God reveals his glory, the end, right? No, there's more to come. Jesus' death and resurrection is the climax. That's the end. But there's something that comes right before this that is the buildup to this, this crescendo, this moment. And all of that happened in Acts, in Act 2, if you will, where it's building up to this moment. And what happened before that was all of the foreshadowing of the Eucharist that builds up to the transfiguration, right? Jesus feeds the 5,000 in chapter 6. Jesus then leaves there, feeds the 4,000. Then Jesus does some more healings, and then he explains to everyone about leaven and bread, and then Peter steps forward. He says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And then Jesus grabs Peter, James, and John, and he takes them up the mountain, and he says to all of the apostles, right as he's getting ready to do that, he gives a prediction of his death, that the Son of Man will suffer and die for you. 
So we have the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, Peter's confession, Jesus' prediction of his death, and then the transfiguration. It culminates with all of his preparation that he's saying that the bread given will satiate, the the bread that I gave to the four, the 5,000, it'll satiate your worldly hunger. But only the true bread that came down from heaven will nourish you spiritually. And on the night before I'm going to die, I am going to give you that bread. That's how much I love you. That I'm going to reveal my divinity to you now so that the scandal of the cross won't make you run away. And I will leave you a lasting memorial of my cross. Jesus reveals his glory on the mountain. The radiating light of his glory doesn't come from heaven. It comes from him. He is divine. He is showing his divinity. It's not from outside, but rather from within. And so it's not to say that he's cloaking or hiding his divinity, but rather that it's hidden in his human flesh. He is true God and true man. And so too in the Eucharist, his divinity is mystically hidden before our eyes but it's truly his body, blood, soul, and divinity. The bread and the wine have been changed into the body and blood of Christ. Do you see him in his transfiguration, in his love, and in his humility as he comes to us as food? We know that the sun exists, even though it hides behind the clouds from time to time. Jesus never ceases to be true God and true man, although he's hidden behind the cloud of bread and wine. Just as everything was glorious at that first transfiguration, so too everything is made glorious here for us, the transfiguration on the altar. Every Mass is a representation of Jesus, the Lamb of Sacrifice, being offered for your sin and mine. At every Mass is a representation of Calvary, the sacrifice of the cross. Every Mass, we feast on the Lamb of God. At every Mass, we have our mountain, our mountain, our mountaintop experience where Jesus is transfigured before us, the Eucharist. It's all pointing back to this moment now where Jesus gives us his divinity to feast on. At the end of the Gospel, it says that Elijah and Moses went back, they went back behind the veil of heaven, and Jesus was there alone. That ought to be our our prayer today. Lord, may I just be alone with you on the mountain. As we carry so much with us here to this altar today, we can lay it at the foot of the cross, at the feet of Jesus, as we come alone with him, as he invites us up the mountain, This is our mountain, the mountain of Calvary, the mountain of our transfiguration where we consume the flesh of our God who loves us. And so let us beg him to hear all that we bring with us and to receive it and that our souls may be transformed through him. Amen.